Hi, it's Mr. Anderson and welcome to Biology Essentials video number 20. This is on biotic and abiotic factors. First thing I should do, I, sh I should define the two. Biotic means living. And so if we're looking at biotic factors, we're looking at all the living things that can affect uh, population or organisms. And abiotic factors are going to be non-living. Um, or without life. And so uh, let me give you an example of each. In 1995, wolves were reintroduced into Yellowstone National Park, and these are the first wolves getting carried into the park. Uh, they, they stayed in an enclosure for a while before they actually released them because they didn't want them to run back to Canada. Um, but that would be a biotic factor. You're adding a living thing to an ecosystem, uh, Yellowstone National Park, and so that's a biotic factor. Uh, an abiotic factor, this would be a graph of atmospheric carbon dioxide. They've been studying the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This is over the last 50 years, and, and you've probably read about that. We've seen an increase of the amount of carbon dioxide uh, over the last 50 years, and that's uh, causing global warming. So the temperature is getting warmer and warmer. Now, temperature is not alive, and so we call that an abiotic factor. Now, both of these biotic and abiotic factors are going to affect organisms, populations, ecosystems, and that's what this podcast is really about. And so the things that I'm going to talk about are factors, abiotic and biotic, so living and non-living factors, and how that causes interactions uh, between cells. The example I'll give you is going to be biofilms that form, and that's as a result of abiotic factors. Um, at the level of organisms, I'm going to discuss the predator-prey relationship. In other words, how one organism can affect the uh, population of another organism. And then finally, I'm going to get uh, at a bigger level, at the, at the ecosystem, population, community level. And I'm going to show you how interconnected an ecosystem can be uh, and how food webs, one tiny change in a food web can actually have huge uh, repercussions throughout that food web. Okay, I want to start at the level of the cells, how changes in abiotic factors can affect cells. Uh, and the example I wanted to give you is biofilms. It's a term most people aren't familiar with, but it actually will affect you uh, more than you might think. Uh, biofilms are formed by bacteria, and so if you have bacteria by themselves, we tend to call those planktonic bacteria. And so that means that they're just floating, moving by themselves. But if you ever put them in an environment where there is something that they can attach onto, and then you also have to have flow in general, and so the flow of the liquid is going to be in this direction. So if you ever have a flow of liquid and then some kind of a, a place that they can attach onto, bacteri bacteria form something called a biofilm. And so if we're talking about something to attach onto, a flow, or at least some liquid, those are abiotic factors. And how are they going to affect bacteria? Well, bacteria will start to form a biofilm. And so this is one bacteria by themselves. But once they start to attach, they'll build slime around them, which is made up of a number of different macromolecules. One big one would be polysaccharides. But essentially what they'll do is they'll build this slime layer around the bacteria. And once you have that slime layer around the bacteria, you can slough off some of those bacteria to become more plankton. But it's really hard to get rid of a biofilm. So an example of a biofilm would be that plaque that forms on your teeth. You can't just get rid of that. You physically have to scratch it off. Now that might not seem that bad, but one thing that's going to affect you probably over your life is going to be uh, wounds. And so chronic wounds, chronic sinusitis, things like that we're starting to figure out are actually caused by biofilms. These are bacteria that are actually building a, a protective home around themselves. And what makes that scary is we normally treat bacteria with antibiotics, and if you apply antibiotics to a biofilm, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't get to the bacteria living on the inside. And so biofilms are a response uh, due to an abiotic interaction, namely a place and a liquid that, that kind of goes through that. Next, I want to talk about how organisms can affect other organisms. And this is the predator-prey relationship. And probably the most famous predator-prey relationship uh, of all when you study biology is the, the, uh, the relationship between the snowshoe hare, and this is a snowshoe hare here, and the Canada lynx. Uh, they both live in, um, in, in Canada or northern North America. Um, and so the, the cool thing about this relationship is the Canada lynx feeds just on the snowshoe hare. And the only thing that can catch a snowshoe hare is a Canada lynx. And so they're linked in this cycle. Um, 
where the population of the snowshoe hare affects the Canada lynx, which in turn affects the snowshoe hare population. And so this is a study from 1937, uh, McLulich, but what they were looking at was pelts from the Hudson Bay Company, because this is data way back in the 1800s uh, through 1930. And what they were looking at is how many snowshoe hare pelts they found and lynx pelts. And th what they could do is they could approximate the snowshoe hare population and then the lynx population. And what you find, let me find a color that you can see, is the snowshoe hare population would go up and then go down and then it would go up and it would go down and it would go up and it would go down. So it would cycle like that. And we see that a lot of time, uh, especially in populations that breed quickly, like rodents or rabbits. But what's interesting is that if you look at the snowshoe hare population, snowshoe hare population, right as this, uh, uh, excuse me, as the snowshoe hare population would increase, we'd then start to see an increase in the lynx population. Uh, why is that? Well, they're feeding on them. And so when the population of snowshoe hare goes up, then there are more of them. So Canada lynx are able to survive, able to pass their genes on to the next generation. And so the lynx population starts to grow. And then as the snowshoe hare population drops off, then the lynx population drops. There's no snowshoe hare to eat, and their population is going to drop off. And so if I try to trace this, what you can see is that there is a predator-prey relationship. Um, now, lots of times we can't see this in nature, and the reason why is that um, there's a lot of other things that might feed on a prey population. But if you look at this, you can see how the, the, uh, the, the predator population has shifted just a little bit to the right, but it's clearly responding to that. Now, what, is, what kind of a, a factor is this? We're looking at a biotic factor. In other words, the biotic factor that is the population of the snowshoe hare is affecting the Canada lynx population and vice versa. Um, now again, it's not always that simple, especially as we move up the ecological levels. So now we're looking at the levels of populations, ecosystems, and, and, uh, and communities. And what we find is that there is this complex food web, and changes within that food web can have huge repercussions throughout the ecosystem. So example, um, wolves were eliminated from Yellowstone Park, um, and they were hunted just by humans to get rid of them because they do have a huge impact on stock on the number of cows. Uh, they, were, they were feeding on cows. And so ranchers got rid of them, and actually the government got rid of them uh, in Yellowstone Park. So what do wolves feed on if they're not feeding on cows? They feed on elk. So what happened to the elk population? Elk population went up. Now, it'd be hard to predict what happened as a result of that. Um, let's, let's see how it, I mean, I mean, you may want to think, how does that affect coyote populations, red fox, beaver, willow, aspen? How would it affect it? Um, well, let me tell you what really happened. As the elk population went up, elk loved to feed, especially on young aspen and willow. And so the aspen populations went down, the willow, or excuse me, the willow population went down, aspen populations went down as well. As a result of that, the beavers were pretty much eliminated from Yellowstone Park because they need aspen and, and willow to feed on. What happened to the coyote population? Coyote population went up because the wolves will actually kill coyotes. They see them as a... Uh, as a um, competitor. As the, as the uh, coyote population went up, they couldn't feed on the elk population because they're simply too big, um, but they did have a huge impact by eliminating a lot of the red fox. And so what had happened was this had been out of flocks as a result of eliminating that, what we sometimes call the keystone species. So what's happened since we reintroduced the wolves into Yellowstone Park, the elk population has taken a dramatic drop. As a result, we're seeing increases in these, an increase in these, a decrease in coyote population. And so we're just talking about biotic factors because what happens to beavers? Well, beavers build dams, and that's going to impact the flow of the water. It's going to slow it down. It's going to create ponds. That's now an abiotic factor. And so you can see how just one species can have huge repercussions throughout that ecosystem. It's going to affect biotic uh, factors. It's going to affect bi abiotic factors. And it's really going to change even at the level of the ecosystem. It's going to have some huge changes, especially when we remove one large predator. Is that good? Is that bad? Well, it has returned balance to Yellowstone Park, but if you're an elk hunter, it's had a huge impact on their population. Um, and so what's the right answer? Um, probably no one right answer. Uh, wolves are probably here to stay, um, but it does show you the complexity 
of life, how it's interconnected, and how changes in one area can affect changes uh, and can affect the population throughout. And so those are abiotic and biotic factors, and I hope that's helpful.